So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences of having a voice in the media. So I want to be clear, what I'm going to say I understand for many of you is not the approach that you would take, okay? We have different ways of doing our work. I was kind of a born fighter. I like a good, dirty, street-level fight, which is what you have to like to get on the mainstream media. I understand for many people, that's not what you can stand. I mean, I'm looking at Julie, who's probably loves it just as much as I do, and Sheila and a few of us who are okay to roll our sleeves up. But there's, I get that some of you can't do this. So I want to make this clear that what I'm about to say, how I do it, is not expecting other people to do that. And it's not in any way to be seen as a judgment. So what I want to talk about is how do you promote radical feminism in what is a very hostile work media environment. And really, when you go up there and you're asked to be interviewed, and I'm interviewed regularly and all the time, you really have to be laser focused. And you've only really got one goal, and that is to disrupt, to interrupt, to dismantle, and to overthrow the capitalist white patriarchal hegemony. That's your goal. And you stick to that with a laser focus. Okay, and the reason you do that, now everyone, I'll just explain what hegemony means. It's a Marxist concept, which I'm going to discuss a bit more. Hegemony means the dominant ideology produced by those in power, which we're all sort of forced to be, believe in, and actually is against our own interests. And I'm going to explain a little bit more as I go on about hegemony. But the crucial thing about hegemony is we have now live in a third wave hegemonic system where that's taken for granted. How you really make hegemony work is you make it the taken for granted concept. So of course, when you're a radical feminist, what you're saying is not taken for granted, which makes our life even harder. Because if I went up there and said porn is empowering, that's taken for granted, that's hegemonic. Everyone gets that. The problem is trying to twist the hegemony in between the ads or with some hostile male screaming at you at the same time he's interviewing you. Now, why do you have this laser focus? You have it because for whatever privilege we have, and we have privilege when we're being interviewed, you don't get to be interviewed unless you've got some class privilege, race privilege, education. Let's be very clear on that, okay? Whatever privileges you have accrued that you have given a public voice, you use that voice for one thing and one thing only, for the voice of all those women who have no voice. Right? And that, when you sort of laser focused on that, then ego goes out the door, fear goes out the door, and you kind of just go after what you have to do. So before we get into how I tend to do it, I want to talk a little bit of theory about what we're up against. And I'm sure most of you know this, but I just want to sort of kind of break it out because when you actually find out how this works, it's pretty shocking. Even as I was doing the research, it was shocking. So the first thing we've got to recognize, we're up against a corporate-owned media that is core to maintaining inequality in capitalism by legitimizing that inequality. Uh, you cannot have systems of inequality and not have an ideological system. Right? Let's just separate, a material system the nuts and bolts of economics where, you know, a few people own most of the world, where women are oppressed, beaten, battered in the sections. You cannot have that material system without having a very sophisticated ideological system to go with it that legitimizes the material system. Okay, that's a core Marxist insight, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. But every material system of inequality has an attendant ideological system, and that's where hegemony comes in. So just to see what capitalism looks like, right? here's a visual representation. Of, and, and the important thing here is not just who owns what, but the interlocking. Right? Because capitalism is not just about a few people owning stuff. It's about an interlocking system whereby they all work together as one. Because they've all got the same thing in mind, which is profits. And capitalism, and this again was Marx's insight, you cannot blame individuals for capitalism. It is a system-based institution, and this is what you do for survival. You have to maximize your profits. And in the United States, you can actually go to be taken to court if you're not found to maximize your profits for your shareholders. And if that means, by the way, destroying the entire coast of Alaska, so be it. <laughs> Right? You understand that. So this is very critical. Now, where we've gotten to is these eight guys own the same as about half the world's population. 
Just take that in for a second. These men together have as much wealth as 50% of the poorest people in the world. It's mind-boggling. And of course, look who they are, all white males. So this is why we're in one of the messes we're in, is that the wealth is concentrated so profoundly. And if you're not a visual representation, look, 1% of the world owns that, 9% owns that, and then look at that dot, that's 40%, that red dot, if you had a map of who owned what. Can everyone see that? All right, so the hideous nature of the distribution of wealth under capitalism is so critical. I'm gonna get into radical feminism in a minute, but we need, I wanna lay the framework for this. And this is probably my favorite Marxist quote, okay? My very favorite, and I've got many favorites. The ruling class rule as thinkers, as producers of ideas, and regulate the production and distribution of the ideas of their age. Thus, the ideas of the ruling class are the ideas of the epoch. Right, let me, that's pretty self-explanatory, yeah? So they, first and foremost, the ruling class rule as thinkers and as producers of ideas. Notice he does not say the ruling class rule as individuals. He talks about class, which means they rule with, as a class with predominant class interests. And that their ideas, i.e. their ideologies, that they deserve to own 50% of the world's wealth, is then spread out to the rest of us so that we buy into their ideas. And how do they get us to buy into their ideas? Well, there are two major systems of inequality that, sorry, that reproduce ideological inequality, the media and education. Now, when I was, an under, when I was going to do my PhD in England, all the Marxist sociologists, which was about everybody in sociology, went into education. Why? Because that was the place that was the reproducer of ideology. But then, of course, radical feminism interrupted all of that in my life, and I saw the forever first anti-porn slideshow that the, was produced by Women Against Pornography, and I was actually you know, writing my dissertation on education, saw the anti-porn slideshow at 22, went home, called my advisor, and said, I'm changing my thesis topic. I'm doing a Marxist analysis of pornography, and I think I wrote the first ever PhD on pornography in the UK. And Really, today, media has become the main reproducer of hegemony. Education is second. So let's take a look at who owns the media. So these are the big ones. And I started to go through and to see, well, I'm going to take just two of them, and I'm going to see who owns what. And I did some digging around. So if I would have taken that the biggest media network in the world is Viacom. And I did not have enough paper in my home to pull out what they own. So this is just a very short list, and I'm just gonna run through. So the cable networks they own, like Atom Entertainment, Addicting Games, Logo TV, Shockwave, BET Networks, BET Pictures, CMT Loaded, Comedy Central, Jokes.com, MTV Books, MTV The Network, RateMyProfessor.com, anyone who's a professor know we speak we spend a lot of time on that, seeing what our students think. Nickelodeon, um, Nickelodeon Consumer Products. This is just, I just had to make this shorter. Spike TV, TV Land, VH1 Classics, Films, they own Paramount Pictures, MTV Films, Nickelodeon Movies, Paramount Animation, Paramount Pictures, Paramount Vantage. They own Vi for Viacom Digital, TheGodfather.com, EPIX, The Last Airbender Movie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can't even go into all what they own. Right, so this is just one company on one of those. Then another example is CBS. So let me just tell you what CBS owns. And again, I just did it very quickly. CBS obviously owns CBS TV Network, CBS Sports, TV Studios, The Movie Channel, um, Big CBS, Flicks, Flicks On Demand. They then own radio stations all over the country and at least five in every state. And I couldn't even go through all the states because I didn't have enough paper at home. Then, also publishing, they own Simon & Schuster, they own Atria Books, Folgers Shakespeare Library, Free Press, Gallery Books, Howard Books, Pocket, Schreiber, Simon & Schuster, etc., etc. A lot of the big publishers they own as well, and I could go on and on, but you get the picture, right? So then, they also own, by the way, a ton of stuff online. And then I look up, who's the major shareholder in these two big companies? So I'm looking at these people, one person, 
is the major shareholder in both Viacom and CBS, some the Redstone. Anyone heard of him? Right, so we're now down to one person controlling two of the biggest single networks, right? So you work, now, just think about what that concentration means in terms of trying to get our message out. Because we're fighting some the Redstone and his position within capitalism. But now we have to get into Facebook and think about what we're fighting when we go online. So let's have a look at some of the largest um, networking sites. So we have to get into Facebook, Google, etc. But look who owns this. So Google owns YouTube, and it bought YouTube for 1.6 billion. Did people know that, that Google owns YouTube? Yeah. And its total assets of Google are 498 billion. Now, God knows what percentage of that is porn, because virtually most porn is searched through Google, okay? So when we go up against the porn industry, we're actually going up against Google, you understand that, which is worth 498 billion. Right? And here's me trying to fundraise and everyone else, right? And look what we're up against. Facebook owns Instagram, one billion. They bought for Instagram for WhatsApp, they bought for 19 billion. And Oculus VR, virtual reality, for two billion. Why? Who, and who, of course, is now doing all the research on virtual reality? It's the porn industry. Do you know they have developed full body suits that sync with the porn movie you're watching? So as this guy is watching the porn, it feels like he's having a blowjob done on him. So it's a full body experience. So if we thought porn was problematic before, imagine wearing a full body suit that is simulating the actual porn movie that you're watching, right? And then we went, we took some people to um, the porn convention every year in Las Vegas in January. 10,000 fans and me defend on, go on to Las Vegas to go to this porn convention. And some of us tried on this virtual reality glasses. You put them on, you look down, and a huge penis pops out. And you're looking at this hideous thing. And then you have a woman comes in front of you, and you have dials, and you can do anything you want to her. All right? That's what virtual reality will look like. Do anything you want to a fister, Fucker, in any way, it was all there. You just had to dial it. And that was the new virtual reality, which I tell you, the R&D for that is going through the porn industry. No question. Porn is the driver of major technology. The total assets of Facebook, nothing compared to Google, which is 84.5 billion. But he's growing and growing and growing, and we all know what he's doing with the information that he gets. So that's the social, that's the social media. And let's just talk briefly about education and what's the problem with that, because we did some stuff around Third Way. So anyone read Bowles and Gintis? Excellent book from 1976 on Marxist theory of education. And what he, they say is to reproduce the social relations of production. And what that means is the social relations of production is you need to reproduce the way that capitalism works through the way that people interact. The education system, so their job is to reproduce the next workforce. Okay, you have to reproduce a workforce. They try to teach people to be subordinate and render them sufficiently fragmented in consciousness to preclude their getting together to shape their own material existence. Can you see that? The job of education is to fragment the way you think. And now think about this. They wrote that before postmodernism, which actually is the method of fragmenting human beings from each other. Because everything's fluid, everything shifts, everything moves, you're an individual making your own choices. I mean, you can't get more fragmented than queer theory and postmodernism and neoliberalism. And actually, you know, it's so interesting that postmodernists think of themselves as like at the vanguard of social change. It's actually the most reactionary neoliberal approach you can have that we're all free floating individuals. You know who said the same thing? Margaret Thatcher, she said there's no such thing as society. She basically said what Judith Butler says in Gender Trouble throughout, there's no such thing as society. So they're, all in, they're always worried about who I'm in bed with as an anti-porn person. You know, they should be looking who they're in bed with. They should take their eyes off my bed and look at their bed a little bit more and recognize that in fact, the postmodernists are totally in bed with the neoliberals, specifically the Thatcher-Reagan area gave birth to, to postmodernism. 
So let's explain, first of all, a little bit what, neo, what neoliberalism is. Neoliberalism, well, I'll do that in a second, actually. So what I would argue is postmodernism plus neoliberalism equals third wave feminism. Okay, this is the perfect storm of third wave feminism. Why? Because, hold on a minute. What, po what neoliberalism holds out is exactly the same as postmodernism, which is the sovereignty of the individual, which is the opposite of Marxism, which is everything is class-based. The oppressor class is a class, and the oppressed are a class with collective interests. Postmodernism came in, blew that apart, and basically said, no, we're all individuals, we're all rational, calculating, pragmatic, and we maximize our own welfare. Now, can you see third wave coming straight out of that? Because this, this is what empowerment is. Right? Notice no radical feminist said empowerment. What do we say? Liberation. We say liberation because that's collective. And as I always just say to my students, let me give you the difference between empowerment and liberation. I am so fucking empowered, I don't know what to do. I've got <laughs> class privileges, race privileges, education. I mean, that is empowerment, me. Right? I got all this empowerment. You tell me what my empowerment means for the women who are going to come and clean the classroom when I'm done lecturing. It means fuck all. They're still on minimum wage, and in fact, it's on their backs that my empowerment and the empowerment of most white educated women happen. So we have to recognize why most of us joined radical feminism, because we said, you know what, even if I'm fine, if you're not, I walk that mile to make a world where you are fine. That's what liberation is. It's not empowerment. So, and I think we all feel that way here, don't we? All of us, that we cannot stand this notion that other women and children as well, we have to put women and children together, are suffering. Why, we're okay. I am really okay. But there, but for the grace of goddess, I say, you know what my bar is, how lucky I am? I wasn't clitoridectomized at eight. I wasn't child brided at 12. I wasn't sold into sexual sex. This is the bar that we all have to recognize how fortunate we are, right? That's, and we fight for those women who don't have that. So in neoliberalism, as in postmodernism, there is no such thing as structural inequality. There is no systems of oppression. There is no groups with collective interests, of course. And there's just lots of individuals making lots of choices with lots of empowerment. That is what neoliberalism is at its core. And then what happens, of course, is that the average journalist today who thinks of themselves as progressive is actually neoliberal. So when you go up against these people, they think they're progressive because they're sex positive, okay, and all of this stuff, where actually they're coming out with reactionary statements. And this is where I have the most fun. Because when I'm being interviewed by these, and men and women, but mainly men, who think they're so out there with their progressive politics, skewer them of how right-wing they are. 